certainly fitting that the 44th Scythe Lecture speaker is Marilyn Hewson, Chief Executive Officer and President of Lockheed Martin Corporation, arguably the icon of the defense industry. In her 30 years at Lockheed Martin, she has held a variety of leadership positions in the organization. Marilyn previously held the position of President and Chief Operating Officer, Executive Vice President of Lockheed Martin's Electronic Systems Business, and President of Lockheed Martin's Systems Integration. Marilyn is a member of the Lockheed Martin Board of Directors. She also serves on a number of other boards, including DuPont and the Congressional Medal of Honor Foundation. In September, Marilyn was appointed by President Obama to the President's Export Council, the principal national advisory committee on the international trade. She was selected by Fortune magazine as one of the 50 most powerful women in business in 2010, 11, and 12, and was named by Forbes as one of the world's 100 most powerful women in 2013. It doesn't get any better than that. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Marilyn Houston. Thank you, Ken, and good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to be with you today. Before I begin my remarks, I want to apologize for not being with you in person at the Yale Club. I had an urgent commitment here in Washington that required me to be here today. But thank you for understanding. Thank you for the technology that allows us to do this. And thank you very much for your warm welcome. You know, when Ralph Heath asked me to speak to you on this very important Wings Club site lecture annual event, it didn't take long for me to discover that I was following in the footsteps of giants. The list of aerospace leg legends that have, that have done this, that have delivered the site lecture, is remarkable. Igor Sikorsky, Werner von Braun, Juan Tripp, Neil Armstrong, the list goes on. So to say that I'm honored to be here is an understatement. Thank you again for your invitation. You know, when I thought about what I wanted to share with you this afternoon, I didn't look any further than the suggestion from General Harold Ross Harris. He was one of the original members of the Wings Club, and he actually founded the site lecture. He suggested that the lecture cover hindsights, insights, and foresights of aviation. This progression from the past through the present and into the future means one thing to me, and that's innovation. In particular, how we inspire innovation. Since 1903, when the Wright brothers made their historic flight at, his, at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, innovation has driven the aerospace industry like few others. And I'd suggest that innovation is more important and more necessary today than at any time in the history of our industry. Our challenges are great. Global security threats continue to escalate. The Department of Defense has indicated that they have a strategic pivot to the Asia Pacific region. Sequestration requires that the U.S. military do more with less and is certainly having an impact on our industry. Affordability is the first word we hear from customers around the globe, and rightfully so. So the question for us this afternoon is how do we continue to inspire innovation in the men and women who propel our industry forward? How do we ignite the spark of genius, the aha moment that creates legends? At Lockheed Martin, the impact and influence of the famous Kelly Johnson, both the man and the myth, continues to this day. Kelly was one of the great airplane designers in history and the first director of, our, of the Skunk Works, where many of our advanced top secret programs are developed. And when it comes to inspiring innovation, we begin with Kelly and his famous 14 rules and practices by which he managed the Skunk Works. If we examine Kelly's 14 rules in detail, they're a perfect reflection of the man. He was a no-nonsense manager with a down-to-brass-tax leadership style that was reflected in his motto, be quick, be quiet, and be on time. His rules spell out a management approach heavy on collaboration and light on bureaucracy. 
They are designed for an industry that is fast, agile, and driven. For example, one of Kelly's rules was that there must be mutual trust between the military project organization and the contractor. Very close coordination and cooperation on a day-to-day -day basis. Another of his rules was that the number of people having any connection with the project must be restricted in an almost vicious manner. Use a small number of good people. So what can we draw from these rules today? I suggest three lessons. First, innovation stems from a relentless focus on the things that matter most. Kelly hated waste. Eight of his 14 rules had to do with efficiency. He cut needless reports, he delegated whenever he could, and he was obsessive about eliminating duplication. He wanted his teams focused on things that drove projects forward so that they put maximum energy into innovation. Efficiency and innovation go hand in hand. The second lesson is that partnerships drive performance. Kelly knew how vital trust is to the government industry partnership. He knew the value of relationships and the importance of a shared purpose, shared processes, and shared values. He knew how important stability is to a business, and he stated the specifications should be laid out in advance and not changed midstream, and that funding should be stable. Make no mistake, Kelly was willing to be flexible. His rules called for a simple, agile design process because he knew that mutual partnerships would result in the better end product for both government and our company. Finally, I'd suggest the third lesson from Kelly's rules is the vital role talented people play in innovation. Kelly knew how to surround himself with the best people and to empower them to achieve great things. His rules called for strong leadership on both the government and industry teams and a reward system that recognizes great achievements, no matter what the level of the employee. So three lessons. Prioritize what matters most, drive performance through partnerships, and let your best people reach their full potential. I'd say those lessons apply just as much today as they did 50 years ago. Today, Lockheed Martin strives to carry those lessons forward. So if I were to spell out for you our modern day rules and practices for inspiring innovation, I'd say, as leaders, we must create a climate that people can do their best work. We must embrace the best ideas, regardless of where they come from. We must embark on missions that matter with a vision that inspires. And we must exemplify strong values in all that we do. So let me take these principles one at a time. I want to talk about how these principles have inspired innovation that led to the development of some of the most iconic aircraft in the history of aviation. More importantly, I'll suggest how these principles are inspiring the development of next generation technology. So first, to inspire innovation, we must create a climate where people can do their best work. Let me give you an example. The invention of stealth technology. It's one of our industry's greatest innovations and one of its most interesting stories. The F-117 Nighthawk is Exhibit A for game-changing power of technology, stealth technology. The fighter's diamond-faceted airframe is recognized around the world by aviation enthusiasts of all ages and is unique in the history of airplane design. And yet, while the F-117 is one of the most recognized aircraft in the world, most people don't know the story behind the story. Most people don't know about the inspiration that led to the innovation, the singular spark that led to the invention of stealth. It's a fascinating story and one that I'm going to share with you today. More importantly, I'm going to suggest what this story means for inspiring innovation in the 21st century. The story of stealth began in the late 1970s. Soviet radar-guided ground-to-air missiles and anti-aircraft batteries, including the SAM-5, were so technologically advanced that they posed a grave threat to the fighter aircraft of the time. 
The Air Force was deeply concerned about the survivability of its fighters in the face of these threats. The question on everybody's mind was, how would the U.S. maintain air superiority? The answer came in the form of an exceptional 36-year-old mathematician and radar specialist named Dennis Overholzer. Dennis worked at the Skunk Works in Palmdale, California. The director of the Skunk Works at the time was Ben Rich, who had taken the reins from Kelly Johnson. One afternoon, Dennis dropped by Ben's office and he presented him with the Rosetta Stone Breakthrough for Stealth Technology. The gift he handed Ben over a cup of decaf instant coffee would make a fighter so difficult to detect that it would be invulnerable against the most advanced radar systems yet invented. Dennis had just read a long, dense technical paper written by a Russian scientist that explained how radar waves were reflected at various angles. In a case of incredible irony, the Russian scientist had tried to interest the Soviet authorities in his work and was ignored. However, in 1975, Chief Skunk Ben Rich did not ignore his young, relatively inexperienced radar specialist. Instead, Ben listened intently as Dennis argued that he could use the algorithms from the paper to design an airplane that would be virtually invisible to radar. Despite Ben's misgivings and the skepticism of some of the more senior engineers, he gave Dennis three months to design and build a scale model of a fighter that would reflect radar. After the model was built and tested, Dennis entered Ben's office to give him the radar cross-section numbers. Ben asked him, well, how good are the numbers? Dennis replied that the new shape was 1,000 times less visible than the least visible shape ever produced at the Skunk Works. Ben took a moment to let that sink in. And then he asked, what did that really mean? If the Skunk Works were to make a model into a full-size tactical fighter, would the radar signature be, say, as big as a Piper Cub or a T-38 trainer, an eagle? I mean, what? According to Ben's autobiography, Dennis replied, Ben, try as big as an eagle's eyeball. I thought you'd enjoy listening to Alan Brown, the first chief engineer of the F-117, explain how lowering radar cross-section numbers is all a matter of angles and degrees. Alan's demonstration explains the F-117's striking, diamond-faceted shape. I am Alan Brown, and I was the program manager and first chief engineer for the F-117 stealth fighter. Okay, let's talk about how stealth works on a real airplane. Very simply, if I'm looking at a flat surface at right angles to the radar, if something like this were one square meter, it would have a radar return of a thousand square meters. If I move it back just about eight degrees, not very much, it drops from a thousand square meters to one square meter. And if I move it down to a very shallow angle, like about 20 degrees to horizontal, it's now down to one ten millionth of what it was when it was up there. So, what's the lesson to be learned about driving this kind of innovation? At the Skunk Works, Ben Rich created an environment where everyone was empowered to bring ideas forward, no matter how unconventional. No matter the engineer's background, experience, or job title, everyone's voice was heard. Every idea was evaluated on its merit. In short, Ben created a climate where people could do their best work. And in the case of the F-117, that climate inspired one of the greatest innovations of aerospace engineering. A second principle to inspire innovation is that we must embrace the best ideas regardless of where they come from. That was certainly the case with the F-35, Lockheed Martin's fifth generation multi-role, multi-variant stealth fighter. The F-35 began as the Joint Strike Fighter Program 
an effort to create an international fifth generation fighter with three variants. The F-35A for conventional takeoffs and landings, the F-35B for short takeoffs and vertical landings, and the F-35C for aircraft carrier takeoffs and landings. Nine partner countries signed on to help develop the F-35. Each of these partners contributed to the development of the operational requirements and to the design and test programs, and each incorporated the expertise of a global network of allies. Israel and Japan have also selected the F-35 through the foreign military sales process. The F-35 is now in low-rate initial production with suppliers all in all partner countries. They're producing components parts for all aircraft, not just the ones being built in their country. So we really are embracing the best ideas of partners and suppliers from all over the world. For example, one of the most impressive things about the F-35 is its short takeoff vertical landing, or Stovall, capability. The F-35B's Stovall system is powered in part by the next generation lift fan, which is built by Rolls-Royce of the United Kingdom. Our engineers work side by side with Rolls-Royce to develop the lift fan technology as part of the F-35's overall Stovall system. And we did the same with Pratt & Whitney for the F-35's engine. In total, the F-35 is the work of a global supply chain spanning thousands of companies around the world. Today's F-35 is a result of the combined efforts of tens of thousands of dedicated men and women as part of one of the most sophisticated supply chains. I can tell you from firsthand experience, embracing the best ideas, regardless of where they come from, helped inspire innovation, and it continues to inspire it today. I'll never forget watching the first F-35B Stovall test almost 13 years ago. That was a defining moment for the entire F-35 team. I thought you might find it interesting to see the F-35B sea trials this fall off the USS Wasp. Here it's being piloted by Royal Air Force Squadron Lieutenant Commander Jim Schofield. Just flying F-35 is uh, the highlight of my career. Um, so being able to come to the USS Wasp and fly F-35 from a, uh, an NHD class marine ship is staggering. Every time I get in the jet, I'm excited to see the, the systems working. I'm excited to fly it. I'm very excited about what it's going to bring uh, the UK and all the partner nations in terms of capability. For the UK, this is the future for our carrier aviation. Uh, the UK is building two new carriers, the Queen Elizabeth class, and the F-35B is the principal weapon system to fly off that carrier. With the Harrier, you had to be constantly uh, refining the controls to make sure you were in the, the right piece of sky at all times. With this aircraft, really your job becomes much easier. Um, it's a much less stressful task, so it's a much safer aircraft to fly. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Yet I think you'll agree with me. That's what's really exhilarating, is that the, if you imagine the future innovations, programs that are still on the drawing board, that some of the students that are right here in the audience with us today will help launch. So let me take a minute to address the students. The students that are here today, I want to encourage, I'm very encouraged to see so many bright young people like yourselves getting ready to pursue careers in aviation and aerospace. I've had 30 years with this company, and I can tell you, if you ask me, there's no better place to be. And that's not just because of the brilliant people you'll get to work with or because of the incredible technology that you'll get to create. It's because of the meaningful impact that you'll get to make for our customers and for our nation and for our allies. And that leads me to the third principle to inspire innovation. Embark on missions that matter with a vision that inspires. I don't think there's a more noble mission than helping to keep our troops safe. And that's what sound battlefield intelligence can do. For generations, we've been proud to help the military create better, faster, and more reliable ways to collect rich, real-time intelligence. The U-2, the SR-71, the Corona Reconnaissance Satellite, each provided intelligence that was absolutely vital 
to national security. And the U-2 is still going strong, 58 years after its first flight. In each of these cases, it was the mission that inspired those teams to push the envelope further than it had ever been pushed. And as we look to the future, vital missions are still driving our teams to reach new heights of innovation. One of these missions was on the cover of the recent November 4th issue of Aviation Week. It showed an ominous looking, stealthy, needle-nosed aircraft with no cockpit. The title of the cover was Son of Blackbird. The online version of the story generated such massive interest that the Aviation Week website actually crashed. The story of the SR-72 begins over two decades ago when its predecessor, the legendary SR-71 Blackbird, was the first retired from service. Since then, our Skunk Works team has been exploring ways to create the new great supersonic intelligence platform, one that could go even faster and higher than the Blackbird. Well, two weeks ago, the world got a glimpse of what we've been working on. With the SR-72, we have an affordable, hypersonic, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, and strike platform that could enter development in demonstrator form as soon as 2018. The twin engine technological marvel is designed to cruise at Mach 6, about twice the speed of the SR-71, and will have the optional capability to strike targets. The mission of the SR-72 is of strategic importance to our nation. Our adversaries are fielding weapons that are increasingly mobile and versatile. The task of finding and stopping those weapons is getting tougher and all the more vital to global security. The answer is an aircraft that can accelerate to Mach 6, a speed we view as a sweet spot for air-breathing hypersonics. At this speed, about 3,600 miles per hour, the aircraft is essentially untouchable by air defenses and even other aircraft. It could fly over any point in the world at any time, reaching targets thousands of miles away in an hour. As our program manager put it, speed is the new stealth. Try to imagine a plane flying twice as fast as the SR-71. There's nowhere the bad guys can hide. The message to our adversaries would be clear. You will be found. That's a mission that matters. For years, though, the challenge was how to build an engine that could reliably go that fast. Modern turbine engines have a maximum speed of Mach 2.5. To get to Mach 6, you need a ramjet engine, where air compression accelerates the jet to unheard of speeds. The challenge is that the ramjet engines needs a running start to get to maximum speed. The plane needs to be moving at about Mach 3 to 3.5 for the ramjet's air compression to take over. So the question was, how do you bridge that thrust chasm between Mach 2.5, the speed of modern turbine engines, and Mach 3.5, the speed at which the ramjet takes over? Well, recently, working with Aerojet Rocketdyne, we overcame the problem. Well, I'm not at liberty to discuss exactly how we did it, I can tell you that we've achieved this innovation affordably by using an off-the-shelf turbine engine rather than creating a new engine from scratch. This is just another example where we've solved a difficult challenge by connecting our employees to the importance of the mission. I am confident that the SR-72 will be inspiring engineers in our industry to do their best work for decades to come. The final principle to inspire innovation is to exemplify strong values that resonate with employees, partners, customers alike. The principle is part and parcel of the other three. It's, it's fundamental. It's written in our DNA. At Lockheed Martin, our values are very simple and very clear. Do what's right, respect others, and perform with excellence. A company's values are what set it apart. It's what enables that company to weather the challenge that test, challenges that test every company and inspire it to achieve ambitious goals. In my experience, 
People want to work for an organization and an industry that align with their values. Customer and supply, customers and suppliers want to work with organizations with that same alignment. Some say it was Alexander Hamilton who first said, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for every, anything. And it's our values that help Lockheed Martin stand for something. It's our values that give employees confidence that we'll stand with them in uncertain times. It's our values that give global customers confidence that we'll stand side by side with them, support their missions, and deliver on our promises. And it's our values that let our suppliers and teammates know that we'll stand by our commitments. A strong foundation of values builds trust and collaboration. It engages employees, suppliers, and customers. And it encourages the creativity and teamwork that leads to innovation. Values are at the heart of everything we do. I know many of you feel the same way. In conclusion, Kelly Johnson's 14 rules continue to inform the principles that inspire Lockheed Martin's innovation today create a climate where people can do their best work, embrace the best ideas regardless of where they come from, embark on missions that matter with a vision that inspires, and exemplify strong values that resonate with employees, customers, and partners alike. It's these principles and others, I'm sure, that will open new frontiers for the aerospace industry. Because we all know that in the not too distant future, we will fly from San Francisco to, to, to Tokyo in minutes and travel to asteroids, to Mars, and ultimately to the stars beyond, where other worlds and new opportunities to inspire innovation await us. Thank you very much. And Orlando, this is an, uh, our gift from the Wings Club to Maryland for today and grateful appreciation for your presentation at the Aviation Seri Leader Series of the Wings Club, November 2013. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much.